So as I'm reading this, I, I couldn't help but notice that every new lady that shows up in this universe is like a nine or a 10. Are there any sixes in this world? Hey, what's up, bookworms and straw hats? We are back again today to talk a little One Piece. Yes, guys, things have changed since I talked about East Blue. I've become quite the One Piece fan now. My kid got me actually a matching shirt to go along with his because we do love to talk about this. So you were right. I was wrong. Let's move forward now and talk about the Arabasta saga. Or is it Alabasta? No matter what way I say it, someone's going to say I'm saying it wrong. Look, in the mangas that I'm reading, guys, it still says Zolo. And I know it's Zoro. So I'm assuming this is supposed to be Arabasta. So that's what we're going to stick with for the rest of this. It was released between 1999 and 2002. Covers chapters 101 through 217. Goes from volumes 12, what, 12 through 23. There's one chapter in 24, but we'll just say uh, chapters, or I'm sorry, uh, volumes 12 through 23. It consists of five main arcs. There's a reverse mountain, Whiskey Peak, a little garden, Drum Island, and of course, Arabasta, all within the Arabasta saga. So we're going to kind of talk about each one here, kind of talk about what I like, what I didn't like. Guys, if you haven't caught my East Blue review where I did talk about that first saga, these are going to have some spoilers in them. So if you guys haven't read this far, I say don't. It's not going to be like a breakdown or anything like that because, guys, I'm a very immersive reader. I don't just continue to write down notes. I just jot down some bullet points I want to remember to talk to you guys about. So it's not what I would call a breakdown. I'm just going to kind of go through it, talk about what I liked, but didn't like, but I'm not going to restrain myself from talking about spoilers. So if you haven't read it, I don't know why you'd be watching something about the second saga, you know, volumes 12 through 23 of a manga series. But hey, crazier things have happened. I appreciate the support. But, you know, I do urge you to bookmark this, come back to it after you have read it. So let's begin, guys, talking about Reverse Mountain. So, you know, we come off quite a high. You know, we're going close to finding that Grand Line, which is really cool. I'm glad. I really like that part. They found the Grand Line. You know, I was, they hear so much about it in East Blue. I was hoping it wasn't going to be one of those things where we're kind of doing that for a while because I was ready for this universe to start to feel a little bigger. You know, and I, I think that, that getting that very early did help. Uh, I, I liked Laboon. Is it Laboon? The Mechanical Well? Because I think it was just so freaking out there. You know, hey, there's a giant whale blocking our way. <laughs> and hey, look, I'm going to punch him. No, he's going to swallow the whole ship. But I'm going to find like this little trap door and go inside this mechanical whale. That's what, that's what I'm loving. It's just completely batshit, like some kind of crazy sci-fi show or something. And I just love that about it. I love it. I like meeting Miss Wednesday and Mr. Nine. That was really had me intrigued because, like I said, I'm ready for this world to feel bigger. And I've seen the poster that comes in this box set, and it's got like hundreds of characters on it. So I knew this cast was going to be getting bigger than all of just the small crew members that we have right now. So I was happy to see it. And, and I initially like those characters, even though, you know, there is some like, okay, what is what is going on here? But I, I kind of like that. I like them introducing the log pose. You know, I guess it's just like their fancy way of saying a compass, but I think it's going to have much, much bigger implications for the series going forward. You got a master navigator on your ship now, and she knows all about a log pose. That's great. So we know where we're going-ish, you know, because there are all these little islands that we've got to explore. What I didn't like as much is uh, this was really short. It was only five chapters, so I don't really think that I would just be nitpicking if I tried to find something wrong here. So I feel like this is just kind of like, the okay, we just finished up that huge arc at the end of what, what Arlong Park. So we're going to kind of move into this now. And this is kind of like that quick transition. I actually finished with Lowtown, didn't we? Yeah. Another one was kind of short. So we are transitioning into the bigger, bigger things. That moves us along, guys, to Whiskey Peak. And what I liked, obviously, was the introduction to Baroque Works. Now, I know this is called uh, Arabasta, but on mine, on the spines here, it does say Baroque Works. So I knew that there was something coming up called Baroque Works. I didn't know what it was. It's just a really cool name. And just finally getting to meet these people, find out what they're all about, learning that there are these, you know, seven warlords of the sea, and actually meeting another one. You know, I think we we met um, uh, what uh, Mihawk in the last the last arc, and now we're going to meet Crocodile, who's supposed to be like Mister Zero. So he's revealed to be someone called Crocodile, and they learn his name, and now they are on the uh, the old shit list as well. They're, they they got to actually escape with uh, with Miss Wednesday here and find out, you know, what we got to do to get off of this little hit list. Uh, I think Zoro defeating the 100 Bounty Hunters, that was just awesome. That, to me, made me think so much of Berserk uh, when Guts just completely just went off 
and kill like 100 soldiers, I think. Now, obviously, Berserks could be a lot more brutal than something like this, but that's just what it made me think of. And throw back to that, to one of my favorite parts of Berserk in the Golden Age. It was a lot of fun. I had so much fun with that. And with this, whereas I said, I always kind of felt like Guts was a bit OP, but that was kind of like the charm of that story. With this, uh, it never feels unrealistic. Like Zoro was just like, you know, closing his eyes and fighting these people one-handed. So it's just, you know, he takes them out without, without much work, you know, for him. But as we know, Zoro is obviously, obviously pretty awesome. So it's, it, it's okay. It works out all right. Uh, but I like the learning that Miss Wednesday is actually uh, Vivi, who is a noble. And what I like about Vivi is that, first, that she's joined the crew. That's cool. Because I said, I wanted the crew to keep getting larger. That was something I was really, really on board for and ready for. Not crazy about these names, which we'll go back to in a second here. But uh, I think it was, in most cases... In every fantasy book I read, every comic I've ever read, anything to deal with history, it seems like every novel is just automatically unlikable and uppity and just completely out of touch. And Vivi seems very relatable. She seems to understand the way that it works for the common folk. And that kind of endears you to her right away. I got to say, the fight between Luffy and Zoro was a little ridiculous, but it was, again, it's what makes this so fun. Uh, I love Zoro's line, which I actually started using on my kids. Okay, but don't, I'll fight you, but don't cry to me when I kill you. Uh, it was one of those, was like, okay, you guys really, you guys are really going to do this? And you can tell this is just one of those things. Whenever I was growing up, it was always like, hey, who would win in a fight between, you know, Batman and the Hulk, you know, that was always just something that we always kind of like to do. You could tell that the creator wants to do as well. People are probably asking them, hey, who would fight in a, win in a fight between Luffy and Zoro? Who would win in a fight? So it just kind of writes it in. It's fun. It, it was it was a good time. And you see, obviously, it was a big misunderstanding. So again, I feel like the, the it's doing a good job of showing that there are stakes involved, obviously, but you're just not forgetting to have fun, which is something I was a little concerned about. It was either going to be too much of one or the other. It was going to be over the top goofiness or it was going to try to get super serious and you, were, you weren't having fun anymore. He continues to walk that fine line right there just perfectly. Gotta say what I didn't like, and I don't know if this is really a hot take. Uh, the naming mechanisms are just so screwy. With the, the, the Mr. Nine or the, the, the Miss Tuesday, I mean, all the stuff, it just gets so confusing. And then you get their real name. There's one part in there where Nami actually holds up a list where she's exactly as Vivi's actually holding up a list of who's who. And I actually did a screenshot with it of my phone so I could actually go back to it and refer to who is who. Because they'll go back and forth between using their real name and their number or their day of the week. It just got super, super convoluted. And I'm talking to my kid about it. He's like, no, that's not Mr. Three. That's Mr. Five. And he does this. And I'm like, I'm glad you get it, man. Because uh, I couldn't keep them all straight. But it didn't ruin the story or anything like that. I just, I wasn't crazy about that naming mechanism at all. So we're just going to go ahead and move to Little Garden. I liked the giant's tale. Uh, Dory and Brogy? Was Brogy or Borgy? Dory and Brogy, I think. Uh, I know there's the idea of their 100 years war they've been having where they got in an argument. They can't even really remember what it was about, but they continue to fight all the time for the last 100 years, so much so that their weapons are like dull now, and they always fight to a draw. But you know, they have like super, super respect for one another. It's just really cool. It's a fun story. Makes me think of, you know, lots of other stories I've read where people were kind of like crash landed, you know, from different different uh, countries fighting each other. They crashed on an island. They had to learn to coexist, and they might still fight, but they end up getting like a, a begrudging respect for each other and eventually friendship. That's kind of what this made me think of. But I, I like that a lot. I, I kind of had a lot of fun because I feel like the Usopp doesn't have a lot to do sometimes in this story. He's just always just like either wanting to be a coward or something like that. But I like this. He like he really really comes to respect these giants and he wants to be one. He wants to visit their land because he has so much for respect for what they're doing so it's just good growth continuing some good growth for some of those characters and i like that they keep introducing multiple types of devil fruits obviously now again i don't pretend i can i think there's three different kinds i didn't write down exactly what they were but you know i feel like a lot of the different abilities are very creative some are more interesting than others which again i'll get to in a second but uh, I, I do like that he's continuing to expand the power levels here. And I'm sort of certain that's something that's probably only going to go up. You know, something I didn't like about the Cradle series is that I just thought it was just power-ups and power-ups and power-ups. And people was like, well, I don't know how you're going to like One Piece then because, you know, they get lots of power-ups. Yeah, but I get story with these characters. You know, it's not even... I'm not, I'm not going to use this as an opportunity to tell you why I didn't like Cradle. Just, it was like reading about someone grinding for XP while playing a Final Fantasy game. I don't get that while I'm reading this story. I feel like I'm getting to know these characters and I want to see them get new uh, you know, power-ups and continue to fight characters that are way stronger than them. 
and we believe that they actually have a chance. You know, they are OP. You know, that's one of my complaints has been that a lot of these characters are just OP. So that's pretty cool seeing these new different fruits. But one I wasn't crazy about, at least what I didn't like, the whole standing in wax for multiple chapters this go around. That, that was kind of dreadful. That got a little boring. Uh, again, I feel like he was just kind of trying to show off some of these different powers that people had. And I and I appreciated that, but I was really one of those where, like I said with the Don Krieg fight, I was like, yeah, it was cool, but it probably went on about two or three chapters too long. That's kind of how I felt about it. Now, in hindsight, it might not have actually been that long, but it felt that long for me. But again, these are things I'm really nitpicking, guys. I'm, I'm loving this series quite a bit. That takes us to Drum Island, and uh, I really, really like this one. This one... Might be my favorite. Now, I know Erebus is the big one here, but Drum Island, for me, has maybe the best backstory in the series so far, and that is the introduction of Chopper. His backstory was amazing. I absolutely loved it. I was actually, like, hitting the feels, and I wasn't expecting it. Very, very good stuff, man. Very, very good stuff with the Cherry Blossoms. I loved it, the not knowing the difference between, you know, uh, the logo for Poison and the difference between that and uh, a pirate flag. <laughs> Oh, man, it was so good. It is such a great, great backstory. And he continues to just absolutely hit grand freaking slams when it comes to the backstories for these characters. They're just always so good, and they're never predictable. And I'm just, I'm enjoying it so much. And for me, it was like, this art could have been just Chopper's backstory, and I probably still would have been my favorite. So again, guys, I'm a big character reader. I love character development and good character arcs. And I feel like Chopper's is just, man, this is really to set him up for me. Like, I won't lie. I saw my kid watching the anime because he was ahead of me. And I saw the character Chopper and I was like, oh God, what did I get myself into? It's like a teddy bear raccoon thing. I didn't really know. Now I'm like, I don't know, man. I might be team Chopper. <laughs> Sanji's my favorite, but I think Chopper might be right there now. I feel like that's what I'm, I'm really, really liking. But uh, yeah, it was, it was just awesome stuff. It really, really awesome. Let's talk about that flag. Uh, I love when uh, Luffy actually gets the flag. He's actually defending the flag. That shot, that actual drawing of Luffy you know, protecting the flag might be my favorite shot in the series so far. Again, made me really think of like Intaro Midura uh, from Berserk. That's like one of his splash pages. That's what it made me think of. Just completely epic. Just so awesome. That's one of those things like if they get this far in season two of, of Netflix's One Piece, I hope they give that moment right there justice because I thought that was just such a cool moment. A funny little thing is uh, when Chopper tries to hide you know, basically, he's like a kid. If he's got his eyes hidden, he thinks you can't see him. <laughs> all right, my, my youngest does that. It's funny all the time. Like, he used to play hide-and-go-seek, and he would just basically put something over his head, and I'd be like, I can see you. He's like, no, you can't. <laughs> I don't know. That's, that's Maybe that's a, a dad shit thing, but I love that. But, uh, yeah, Wapple, that's a that's a character, right? Uh, the Baku, Baku fruit, I think, called, but basically whatever he eats, he can turn into. That That's very creative. It gets very weird. You know, but I love the idea. Hey, cool. I'll just I'll just uh, swallow a machine gun. I become a machine gun. That's a neat idea. Almost kind of like Green Lantern-ish. I like that. But uh, yeah, very, very good fight, I think, with that character. Never felt like it was overly long. It was more than just, you know, Luffy punching somebody in the face real hard. Felt like we had to actually think a little bit. And, and I like that because I was worried. It just seemed like all these fights was just, okay, well, gum, gum, bazooka, gum, gum, pistol. And it was like, okay, well, can we get some some depth, some layers to these villains, I think. And I think he's starting to really, really do that, which we'll see in the next one. Uh, he does very, very well. So uh, setting up Crocodile with kind of a mini boss, I guess you'd say, with Wapo. I thought it was really well done. I like that we get our first mentions of like a world government out there uh because i think we've already seen so far is just the marines but this we got i think they're called the levely the lever levery levely something live lively something like that i forget what they were actually called but uh yeah very cool to know that there is some kind of actual government out there you know got their fingers in all these pies pulling the strings maybe and getting to know these things so it feels like it's setting up to something even bigger and to me guys that's how you do world building right you know you just give us little taste and say hey Eventually, we're going to go check out that hill that's way off in the distance, and I do like that. Uh, as far as didn't like, nothing. Like I said, this this is probably my favorite arc in all of the Arabasa saga. I loved it so much. It is mostly because of Chopper. And, of course, like the, Luffy's like carrying the person up the wall with one arm. Really good. Really good stuff. I mean, just so many good moments in this arc. Uh, Arabasta, obviously, this is the big one. I kind of like that everyone in this kind of got like their own fight. You know, I love that everyone's kind of, they were all the, all the straw hosts were kind of paired off 
on their own, a one-on-one -on -one fight. It's actually faked me out once. I thought Nami actually got stabbed and killed. And I was like, whoa, what balls, you know? So uh, he's doing a good job at showing these people grow. You know, I love the, the way that they're the, each one of the members of the crew gets their moment and they're all growing. And they don't just have, you know, someone's got to come in at the last moment. Luffy's got to come in and save them. You know, they're actually having like their own fights and stuff. And I appreciate that. I thought it was really cool. You get to see Zoro, you know, finds like his new ability to beat, uh, is it number two? I don't remember which one he was fighting. Uh, I love uh, Sanji's fight where they're both just using kicks. <laughs> they know how to do is kick. So they're both using kicks, but then he gets, uh, he's able to uh, transform into anything he wants. He keeps transforming into Nami because he knows that Sanji won't hurt him if he looks like Nami. Very cool. And they have like a begrudging respect after that. And I think that's very, very cool. Nami uses uh, Usopp's like bubble wand or whatever it was to, and has to learn how to actually use the weather to defeat her fight. It's really good. And then the big one for me, guys, was seeing Luffy, Luffy lose. You know, Luffy, like I said, I felt like my big complaint in East Blue was Luffy was just too OP. And this, seeing Crocodile, who is just the villain that this series needed, I feel like uh, that was that was that was needed to happen to see Luffy get knocked down a peg and realize he can't just punch everything in the face as hard as he can and always win. And he gets his ass kicked. Nico Robin has to actually save him there. And Nico or Miss All I forget what they were calling her, Miss All Sunday. I don't even remember what they were calling her at first. Uh that was a character where I'm like Friend or foe? I'm not sure. Does she have ulterior motives? Well, I'm at the end. I still don't know what her motives are, but I definitely think that there's a lot more layers to come with that character. But Crocodile, again, I feel like this is the villain that we needed because a lot of the villains have been kind of slapsticky and kind of goofy. Look, I love Buggy. Buggy's my guy. But, you know, I wanted one that was just kind of a stone cold killer. And I feel like that's what Crocodile is. He's no nonsense. He will do whatever it takes. He's done some horrendous things and he'll do more. You know, he will do more to get to uh, what he wants to achieve. And I thought that was a really, really good character. And then to have him actually beat Luffy in this first fight. So I think they have three fights, but he actually beats him in this first fight. That was a big deal. And I forgot to talk about Koza. Koza, now that's uh, what Vivi's uh, childhood friend. He, that Another great backstory. It's like, how is this guy just batting a thousand when it comes to backstories? He is just really damn good at writing backstories. I mean, characters I don't even know. He's writing backstories now, and I'm like, wow, I'm really all involved in this. You know, where a lot of times I'm like, can we just focus on the present storyline? This, I'm like, give me backstories for, hey, that guy that's standing back there, can I have a backstory for him? It's probably really good. You know, and again, that's how you flesh out your world. He's just doing an amazing, amazing job at that. Uh, if there's anything I didn't like about this arc, uh, I don't know. Uh, I think I like just about all of it. Uh, it might have been a little touch too long. I didn't even mention Sanji fighting the crocodiles. That was really fun. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I mean, maybe it was a little long, but I felt like it was kind of the arc. That, that you, that you needed that. You needed that big moment in this arc. You needed this big, huge battle. And I, and I, I was okay with it. Again, I, I feel like sometimes the fights in the series can go on a little, a little too long, but I think that's just a, that's just a manga thing. Fights are just going to go on long because I think it's easy to get out issues really fast when you can write a, when you can draw a splash page over and over again. And I enjoy those like everyone else. So I don't really have a real problem with it. So, I mean, if you can't tell guys in my final thoughts here, I like this art quite a bit. I still think I like East Blue this, just a little better because it did have backstories for all the main Straw Hats. And again, as you can tell, the backstory and the character development is what I am enjoying the most about this. But I'm still impressed by how much something that is just so over the top, some are ridiculous. A total blast is just continuing to assassinate you in the feelings when you aren't expecting it. That I mean, everybody told me that this, and you know, it's not that I didn't believe it. I was just like, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I'm just going to kind of go into it with an open mind. And I've become a full-on mark for this series now. I mean, it's, it's I'm really enjoying it. You guys were right. Again, I can't say you were right enough. This is enjoyable for all ages. It's been a huge bonding thing between my kid and I. He's left me in the dust, though. Guys, if you guys don't know, I'm going to be pausing uh, while I wait for Philip to catch up because uh, Philip Murphy and I are going to be doing discussions about One Piece here in the future. So I'm going to be pausing before I move along to uh, it's, uh, Sky Island, I think it's called. But as for this, like I said, I think Crocodile, just the villain that we needed for this arc. I don't think we've seen the last of him. I didn't even mention getting to meet Ace, who turns out to be Luffy's brother. And he gave him a, I think he gave him a note. And I don't think we ever saw the, the, the note blank or something. So maybe it's got like some of that Roger Rabbit invisible ink on it. Who knows? Who knows what's going on there? Uh, I guess if I have any regrets, I, I Smoker was in it, but still didn't really get very much from him or, or Tish, Tishagi. Is that her name? Tish, 
Tagashi. Tagashi? Is that her name? Didn't really still didn't get a ton for those characters. And I was kind of hoping this mysterious dragon character that showed up in Logetown would kind of show up again. So, uh, I don't know. There's obviously plenty of room to go, guys. I'm not even one box set in to this. Or I am one box set into the series now. But so, uh, obviously, I know that there's a lot more room for these things to happen. But, uh, yeah, I am, I am very interested in knowing right now, I think my biggest question mark is obviously who are these other warlords? That's a big one. And uh, what's what's Nico Robbins' uh, full motives? I want to know what, what's going on with her because she has officially joined the crew now. And I do think it's kind of funny that everyone's kind of suspicious of her except Sanji. Sanji's like, pretty lady. And again, I uh, have no problem with Sanji liking pretty ladies because I like pretty ladies too. So uh, I love the sixes, but I love the tens just like everyone else, you know? Hey, bring them all on. So guys, that was the... Uh, Erebasta Saga and One Piece. Continue to have a blast with this series. I hope you guys are enjoying you know, my my journey through this. Uh, for me, it's just my way of saying thank you for getting me interested in the series because if you guys didn't watch all of my year-end content, I talked about One Piece a lot. That was my biggest surprise last year. It was a surprise, you know, let alone that I was actually reading it, but that it was one of my favorite things that I read during the year, which is quite a big deal. So uh, again, thank you. And uh, yeah, it's been a great, great bonding experience with my kids. So you guys, you're my age, you got young kids and you know, they're into it. Hey, pick it up. I think you might find something there that uh, you're both gonna like. And that's that's hard to do. It's hard to find things in media that, you know, outside of like a Star Wars or something that everyone of all ages can kind of appreciate. And I, and I definitely think that this is something special. And uh, again, you guys were right. So Erebasa, guys, what did you think? Did you like it better than East Blue? Drop in the comments, guys, and let me know your favorite part from Arabasta, and I will talk to you there.